You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Useless information. Hi, I'm Steve Silverman, and you're listening to a classic episode of the Useless Information Podcast. Next up, we have a quirky story titled The Great Toilet Paper Shortage that I wrote for my second book, Lindbergh's Artificial Heart. Never could I have imagined there'd be a real toilet paper shortage when the pandemic hit in 2020. Now, if you've listened to all the episodes recorded prior to this one, it's obvious that all the stories were retellings of those in my books. But I was plowing through those stories so quickly that I concluded I'd better stop doing so or there'd be no reason for anyone to purchase one of my books. So after this episode, I began to move away from that format and began researching and writing brand new stories for the podcast. Now, I was working two full-time jobs at the time, so I really had no choice but to also slow down the release of new episodes. So instead of a new episode every single week, it quickly became two weeks and three and then finally once a month. And that would be my schedule for many years, releasing a new episode about once a month. Sometimes it would take five weeks, but say once a month. Anyway, sit back and enjoy. Welcome to the Useless Information Podcast, my collection of fascinating true stories from the flip side history. My name is Steve Silman. Today's story is on the great toilet paper shortage. But before we get to today's story on the great toilet paper shortage, let's first talk about today's question of the day, which is actually a two-parter. It's two questions related to the famous Iron Butterfly song from 1968 called Inagata De Vida. I have two questions related to that classic song. The first question is quite simple. They titled the song Inagata De Vida, but that's not what it was supposed to be. It was mispronounced. What was the original title? Now the second question is a little bit more obscure, and that is, in 1996, Iron Butterfly a band member from Iron Butterfly became involved in a conspiracy theory, one that conspiracy theorists talked about for years. And it has a little bit to do with the world of physics. And my question is, what was it? What was this guy involved in? And now for today's story on the great toilet paper shortage, which actually is one of my favorite stories. It's got some numbers in it, and it has some... Well, anytime you're talking about the bathroom, it's a little questionable. So I'll try and keep it clean, but I'll warn you in advance that there may be some things thrown around that you may be a little uncomfortable with. Now, it doesn't take too much of a genius to realize that toilet paper has not been around forever. Today, we get upset if we go in a bathroom and we don't find it. But if you were alive 100, 150, 200 years ago, even bef and of course long before that, there was no toilet paper. So what did people use? Well, believe it or not, it depended on where you lived. It depended on what was natural to your region. And most people, you could say, probably used leaves and sticks and things like that. But if you lived in a coastal region, maybe you used mussel shells. If you lived in Hawaii, actually, some people used coconut shells. If you lived in ancient Rome, uh, it was very common for there to be a sponge that, was, uh, that there was a bucket and you dip it in brine. And America was a little different. Prior to the invention of toilet paper, many people use corn cobs. You'd actually go into the outhouse and there would be corn cobs there and you would use that to clean with. A little uncomfortable uh, to talk about, but that's what they used. Now this all started to change with newspapers. Once newspapers became fairly common, people had something better to actually clean themselves up with. So people used newspapers and eventually pages of really low-cost books that they could find or books they didn't care about anymore. But really what changed everything was the Sears catalog, because here you had for free hundreds and hundreds of pages of paper that were great to use. They were fairly soft and disposable, and they decayed, and everything was great about it, until Sears started using glossy paper. And people actually wrote to the company complaining about the use of glossy paper. I can't imagine what they wrote. I mean, what would you say? Uh, you know, hey, you're using glossy paper. It's not soft and, you know, absorbent anymore. You've got to go back to that old newsprint type stuff. Well, eventually toilet paper did come around, and the first use of real toilet paper was in England in 1880. And it wasn't on a roll like we're used to today. It actually was little individual squares that came in a box. The fluffy stuff, the soft uh, Charmin type like we like to use today, actually came around in America in 1907. 
And now for some statistics on toilet paper. Now I'll warn you in advance of two things. First, they only asked 106 people in the survey, so I'm not sure how accurate it really is, but some of the numbers are quite interesting. And second, some of the things they asked are a little questionable in taste, so if you want to just turn down the sound for a little bit, uh, you may want to do that. The first little tidbit is, how many sheets of toilet paper does the average person use each time they go and use the facilities? Well, it turns out that it averages out to 5.9 sheets. Maybe that's why there's that little piece always hanging on there. Really, though, it's about 5.9, around 6 sheets per usage. Now, this is the one's a little questionable. They ask how many people wipe from front to back and how many from front to back. And I don't know why anyone even needs to know this, but it turns out that 45% actually go from front to back. And even more kind of gruesome is that 60% of the people actually look after they've done so. Now, less on the yucky side is that 42% of the people folded their toilet paper, 33% crumpled it, and 6% would wrap it around their hand for use. Believe it or not, 50% of the people asked, that's half of the 106 people, said that at some point in their life they were forced to use leaves. And actually, 2% have used money. Pretty yucky. I don't know. It must have been really, really desperate if they used some money. And now the story that I really want to tell you about, which is the great toilet paper shortage itself. And this is a story that goes back to late 1973. You see, there had been a story in the newspaper that the government, the U.S. government, was falling behind in getting bids for, of all things, toilet paper. Now, young people today may not you know, even realize it, but there were a lot of shortages in the early 70s. There was a shortage of oil, rubber, coffee, medicine. It just seemed to go on and on and on. Today, of course, kids get upset if there's a shortage of their latest Nintendo game, but it's not quite the same thing. Anyway, the writers for The Tonight Show, starring Johnny Carson, picked up on the story and decided to include a little joke in Johnny Carson's monologue about this shortage of toilet paper. And it was only meant as a joke. But the next day, people ran out to the supermarkets and stocked up on toilet paper. And the supermarkets sold out of every roll they actually had. As a result of all this hoarding, Scott Paper, which is the largest manufacturer of toilet paper at the time, was forced to increase to full production. And they ran video on television showing people there is no shortage of toilet paper. In fact, Johnny Carson, several days later, was forced to get on the air and tell everybody, hey, this is a joke. We we're only joking around. You don't need to stock up on toilet paper. But people didn't get the message somehow, and they continued to stock up and take every roll off of the shelves at the uh, supermarkets. Eventually, after about three weeks, things returned to normal and the great shortage was over. But it is a pretty funny story. There was no shortage to begin with, just a few words on the TV, and sure enough, there's everybody stocking up and creating a shortage. I thought I'd end this story on toilet paper with just one little tidbit, and that is which way, what is the proper way to actually put the paper onto the spindle of the toilet paper dispenser? I've actually had a little debate with one of my friends over this, and that's why I mention it. She insists that the toilet paper should be on the spindle so that it comes around the back and down, where most people actually put it with the toilet paper over the top and hanging that way. She will actually go into people's bathrooms, and if she sees it the way that she doesn't like, she'll flip the toilet paper over. And I've actually gone in after her and noticed she's done it in my own bathroom. That's how I know. Now, there really isn't any solution to this. I mean, who really cares? But if you are concerned about it, just go to Spencer Gifts or any gag gift shop and look at the rolls of toilet paper they have there. They sell them with crossword puzzles on them. Sometimes they have uh, fake money printed onto the toilet paper. And you'll notice the only way you can put it onto your dispenser is with the paper coming over the top. Otherwise, the gag is hidden from everybody's view. Now, some ingenious inventor has really come up with a perfect solution. I don't know if you can buy it anywhere, but I did see this in Inventor's Digest one day. And that is, he's come up with a dispenser that actually rotates. So if you go in the bathroom and you don't like it, you just flip it 180 degrees. Then the next person can go in and flip it 180 degrees again. And you just keep flipping it over, and eventually, you know, who knows where it'll end up. Maybe you can put it sideways, and that solves it for everybody. Useless, useful, I'll leave that for you to decide. And now for the answer to today's question of the day, which was actually a two-parter related to the Iron Butterfly hit from 1968 called In a Gata de Vida. My first part of the question was very simple. What was it supposed to be? It's not In a Gata de Vida. Well, it turns out 
the lead singer was drunk when they started uh, you know, writing the lyrics and recording the song the first time. It was supposed to be in the Garden of Eden. Well, he was you know, a little bit too much alcohol, and he spit out in a Gata de Vida, and they decided to stick with it, and that's the final version they recorded. Now, the second question has to do with conspiracy theories. And the reason I tell a story is that I am a physics teacher by day, and I tell this story to my students every single year, because in the 1990s, Iron Butterfly found themselves as part of a conspiracy theory, one in which they believe the federal government assassinated one of the members of their group. Well, not an original member of the group, a guy named Philip Taylor Kramer. Uh, he was the bass guitarist in the 70s for Iron Butterfly. And at night, right after uh, the group broke up, he got a degree in aerospace engineering and went to work for the federal government. Now, on February 12, 1995, and I did misspeak at the beginning of the podcast saying 1996, but it actually was February 12, 1995, he made a bunch of frantic phone calls to different people, including friends saying that they were after him, that the, uh, he was going to kill himself, he didn't know he was going to survive, and all of a sudden he disappeared. He had an appointment, supposed to pick someone at the airport. He never even got there. Something happened to Philip Taylor Kramer, and no one knew. And for the next four years, a bunch of conspiracy theories came about. It was actually believed that Philip, along with his father, had actually figured out how to exceed the speed of light. Now, the speed of light is the actual speed limit in the universe. Nothing can go faster than that. But supposedly, these two men had actually figured out how to do it. And it was believed that the federal government, for some reason, wanted him dead and arranged for Philip Taylor Kramer to be killed. And he wasn't seen for years after this. Now, this conspiracy just wasn't confined to fans of Iron Butterfly, you know, kind of like Paul is dead for the Beatles, but actually spread to the mainstream. In fact, uh, it was on the Oprah Winfrey Show, America's Most Wanted, and even a segment of Unsolved Mysteries. So this was getting into the mainstream. But then on May 29, 1999, the story actually came to an end. There were some photographers who were looking for old car wrecks to shoot at the bottom of Decker Canyon near Malibu, California, and they came across a Ford Aerostar minivan, and inside they found the skeletal remains that were later identified as Kramer's. Now, based on the forensic evidence that was collected at the scene, and of course those crazy phone calls he made on the day that he disappeared, it was actually ruled that it was probably a suicide, that Kramer had committed suicide. Of course, there will always be those people that believe in conspiracy theories such as this and have concluded that the federal government really did bump him off. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's useless stories on the great toilet paper shortage and, of course, a little background on Inagata de Vida. If you'd like to read more true stories just like this, be sure to get a copy of one of my books. They are Einstein's Refrigerator and Other Stories from the Flip Side of History, and the second book is Lindbergh's Artificial Heart, More Fascinating True Stories from Einstein's Refrigerator. Both are written by me, Steve Silverman, and the books are available through your local bookstore, through online retails, and of course through your local library. If for some crazy reason you'd like to contact me, simply drop me an email at useless at steve.silverman.name. That's useless at steve.silverman.name. Of course, you can check out my website, which has many, many more stories on it, and a little background on myself also. And the website address is uselessinformation.org. That's uselessinformation.org. Thanks again for listening.